Well, turn in your Bibles to Genesis 24. We'll continue, of course, our study. We're seeing the book of Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. There's a lot. We're seeing all different kind of things about them. In these first five lessons, the main person is Abraham. And that's why when we get to chapter lesson six, Isaac's going to be the main guy because Abraham is going to be dead. And there are many events and truths in the life of Abraham. He's a man of faith, and we're going to see it. And I'm going to tell you, probably nobody in this room would sacrifice their child. I mean, I just, I just don't know. I mean, I guess if God appeared to you un, in, in person and you had known him and you've seen him before and talked to him before and know everything and the covenant, maybe it would be a little bit different to do that. But it just is, you just see how hard it is. And um, uh, we saw that he knew that, his, that God would bring uh, his son back from the dead. Abraham had passed the test. At age 100, the son was born. Some 40 years later, it's time for the bride. And uh, where are they going to get her? How are they going to get her? What's going to happen? And we've talked about it. Let me remind you of something. We got Abraham and we got Sarah. And the plan was Abraham and Sarah would have a son. And we know that they had a problem. And they had a son named I, uh, Ishmael. And he's not the right, he's not the son. He's Abraham's son, but he's not the son. He's not the one that the Messiah is going to come through. Remember the promise back to Adam and Eve that there's a Savior coming? When God told Abraham, I'm giving you a land, a what? Seed and a blessing. The seed ultimately is, is offspring, but the seed ultimately is the Messiah. And the blessing is for the whole world, which is salvation that can come. And the land, of course, is the land we call land of Israel. So Abraham knew that he was supposed to have a son, and they jumped the gun, and they got all kind of problems from this. And so time has gone by, and then Abraham lied, and Abimelech came along and said, yes, I'll take this woman. And then God stopped it, didn't let it happen, let Abimelech not have any relations with her, and went basically put them back together. So we are at the point now where we got to have the descendant. We got to have the son. And we're going to see it. And we see that Abraham said this. He called in his servant, probably his, the, the one who ran the whole household. Remember, the household is, is at least 318 men, not counting their families, all those other things. There's just a lot of people with Abraham. And he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to my relatives. I want you to find a bride for my my son. First of all, don't pick one. We don't want one from around here. I don't want you taking my son back up there. I want you to go and find one and bring her back. And he said, that sounds good, but what if she won't come back? What if I find somebody there and she won't come back? He says, well, you're released from the oath. So he put his hand where? <laughs> Under his thigh, and he took off. And he went all the way there. And when he got there, uh, and, and let me put this uh, uh, for us up here. You know, I said, the brides and babies go together. You, you gotta, we got to, if we're going to have a baby, if we're going to have a, uh, y you know, somebody, uh, you know, because we've had the son was born, that was Isaac, laughter. And so now we got conflict right here. And it goes on. And so we got the son. But if we're going to have, now on offspring, right? Where's the offspring going to come from? Who? Isaac, right? So Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. And so now we got this son. But if you're going to have an offspring, he's going to have to be what? He's going to be married. So we got to find a woman. So let's just put Isaac down here, and we're looking for the bride. And so he makes the trip to find the bride. And so this is where we are. And, and uh, so we're looking at three things tonight. The bride for Isaac, the death of Abraham, which is sad, and the twins are born. Twins. Twin. I love twins. I, I are one. Uh, Jean's a twin. I'm a twin. My twin sister's a twin. Jean's twin sister's a twin. But they're going to be twins. Now, let me ask you a question. We got twins, right? We know there's twins coming. Do we know that? What's their names? Jacob and Esau. But that's a problem. Do you know why that's a problem? Why is that a problem? Huh? One of, the seed's got to come through one of these. We got Abraham to Isaac and Isaac to... Well, you got two kids here. And who decides who the seed comes from? God does. We'll see it. 
So here we are, and we're fixing to see what happened. Well, we're a little bit ahead of the game here. Let's get the bride. So he's made this long trip. He's looking for the bride for Isaac, and uh, he's made the long trip. And uh, who came to get the bride for Isaac? Abraham sent his servant to make the long trip to the relatives. He gets there. Do you remember what was the, the thing? Well, he said, uh, how am I going to find this right woman? So I happened to get there, and there's all these young girls are coming out to water their stuff. And he just says, oh, Lord. Whichever one comes out, that I mean, that's, you know, she's going to be the right one. I'm just going to say this, and she'll say, "Let me water, give you water, and let me water your camels." I, 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 it, it should be the the key. And so, in chapter 24, uh, about verse 33, uh, he did that. She came out, and uh, she did it. And he said, "Who whose family are you?" And she says, and she names, and he knows it. Oh my gosh, this is Abraham's family. I, I, he said, go up there and get a wife from my what? Re- my relatives. And without even knowing who they were, it's the right one. And so he gives her rings and stuff, and she goes running back to tell her mother. And she's got a brother named Laban who does what? What can you know about Laban? He, he's what? He likes money because as soon as he saw those rings and bracelets and gold and he went right out there and said, what are you doing out here? Come on to our house. We got straw. We got camels. We got everything. We, we're, gonna, we're, you know, we're just going to do it all for you. And so they all sit down for a meal. And everything seems to be good. But here's what the, the servant says. I can't eat until I've accomplished my business. Look about it, verse 33. But when the food was, this is uh, Genesis 24, verse 33. But when the food was set before him to eat, he said, I will not eat until I finish my business. So he, he's got, and so he tells the story. And uh, if you notice that in verses 34 through 41, he tells the story and he, he reviews it. Let me just look at it real quickly. I'll do it really fast. He said, the guy said, well, go ahead and tell me the story. And he said, I'm Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master. This is verse 35. He's become rich. What is Laban saying? Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. He's become rich, and he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and servants and slave women and camels and donkeys. Now, my master's wife, Sarah, bore a son to my master in her old age. How old was she? Ninety. And he has given him all that he has. So he's done it. And my master made me swear, you'll not take a wife from the sons of the daughters of the Canaanites in whom land I live. Go to my father's house, to my relatives, and take a wife from my son. And then I said, what, what if she doesn't come? And, and then he basically says, you'll be released from the deal. And so, he, he, he's the, so the servant came up with a plan. Remember the plan? Look at verse 42. So I came today to the spring, and the Lord God of my master Abraham, if, you, if now will you make my journey on which I've been going successful? Behold, I'm standing by the spring. May it be that the young unmarried woman who comes out to draw water and to whom I say... Please let me drink a little water from your jar. She says to me, you drink, I will draw from your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master. So that servant is telling the story. And what was the servant's plan? It was to ask some. Now, notice he said unmarried woman. Because there were a bunch of women came out there. It wasn't just unmarried women who were coming to get the water. It was the women coming to get the water. And he said, let me make sure, you know, it's an unmarried woman who come. And I I asked the question. And we see what happened. So what did Rebecca do? Before he finished praying, Rebecca came. And if you look at the passage, verse 45, when I had finished speaking in my heart, Rebecca came out with a jar on her shoulder. She went down the spring to drew water, and I said, please give me a drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I'll water your camels also. I drank, and she watered the camels. (laughs) And then I said to her, whose daughter are you? Well, who are your relatives? And she said, the daughter Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcor bore to him, and immediately he said, I put the ring on her on her nose and the bracelets on her wrist. And I bowed low, bowed low and I worshiped God and blessed God who guided me. He says, guided me to my master's family. It's so amazing. She, she is the relative that I gave the gifts to. And if you look at the top of your, I guess it's your next page, it says, what did, the ser- what did the servant realize? There is no coincidence, no fate, and no chance. Do you believe in fate and chance? You shouldn't. You know, there's no such thing as chance. There's no such thing as luck. Do you understand that? 
God's in control of all things. God works all things according to the counsel of his will. There's no such thing as a lucky break or unlucky or bad. Or, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. He can't say, I just was lucky this girl showed up at the right time. It's not luck. It's the same thing. Just like when Ruth and Boaz, and, and Ruth says, what do I do? And her, her mother-in-law said, you just go out and find a field and work in the field. And it says it just so happened she went to Boaz. There's no such thing as just so happened. It, that was God's plan. And God's plan was for Rebecca to come out, and he saw her, and he, it was like, that's the one I've got to ask. And sure enough, there is no coincidence and no, no fate. And so watch, what, what would you do if this, you know, uh, of course, here's Laban, and he's thinking, this guy's rich. This guy's rich, and he's, he's, he's come to find a bride. And so wh what would you do? Well, anyway, what did the family decide? Look uh, a little further down. Look at verse 50. Then Laban said to Beth, and Bethuel replied, the matter has come from the Lord. This must be from God. Why? Why do they think it's from God? What would you say if somebody asked you, why do they think it's from God? There's no what? There's no coincidence. I mean, they look at it and said, is it, is it by luck that Rebecca came out there and said exactly what he prayed for and exactly being the relative of Abraham? They knew that it had to be from God. They knew that. And so Laban and Bethuel replied, The matter has come from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you, good or bad. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has, as the Lord has spoken. So he basically says, Take her, take her and go. Wow. Now, if you're Rebecca, what do you think? Wait just a minute now. Here's the question. Why didn't they ask Rebecca, do you want to go? Well, it could be that it was not the custom. The, I mean, back in those days, did people, did mom, daddies go together and decide which sons and daughters were going to get married? I mean, they did. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. All right? What's that from? You fiddle on the roof? I mean, so they, they didn't ask her. But obviously, it may be that she... They realized she wanted to go. You just don't know exactly. But they didn't really ask her. They just said, well, okay, let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. They basically said, this must be from God, so just go ahead and, and go. Wow. So you can see that. Now, do you remember when we talked about a Jewish wedding? What does the, the groom bring when he comes to the father? Some kind of down payment. So what? What did what did the servant bring? Uh, those gold, the bracelets and the rings and all that stuff. He's basically saying, uh, my my master, and I'm representing him, wants his son to marry your daughter. And here's the stuff. And they said, sounds good to us because this must be from God. What else could it be from? And so in verse 52. When Abraham's servant heard these words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. And the servant, and the servant, what did he do? What did he bring? Articles of silver, articles of gold, and garments, and he gave them to Rebekah. He also got, oh, he also gave precious things to who? Her brother and to her mother. Wow. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. And when they got up the next morning, he said, send me away to my master. So everything looks good, doesn't it? But not exactly. So what happened? Was the family ready for Rebecca to leave? What's the answer? No, no. In fact, it, it, it was a little bit strange. It says, when they got up the next morning and said, said, send me to my master, verse 55. But her brother and her mother said, no, let the young woman stay with us a few days. Say 10. Afterwards, she may go. What are they really asking? What are they saying? Are they asking him to go back and then her to come later? I don't think so. What are they asking him to do? Wait. Wait 10 more days. What's he going to say? I'm not waiting 10 days. I have a plan. My master sent me here. My goal was to find the wife and bring her back. It is not to stay here. In fact, he's not coming here to look this whole thing over. I'm supposed to take her back and... I, 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 I'm not going to wait and look at verse 56. Uh, he said, however, he said, do not delay me. 
since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away so that I may go to my master. He said, don't delay me. Don't stop me from going. Because this is, this is the plan. Wow. So what, what happened? And, and you can almost see that, that uh, it, you know, it's almost like, well, why don't you just stay here? Maybe the longer you stay here, he'll end up coming here to find her, to find out what's going on. And then he'll be here and she won't have to leave. But that's not going to work. And he said, no, no, I, I, I've got to go. And so what happens? Verse 58, they bring her in. Look at verse 58. Then they call Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Does she know that she, she doesn't realize this, but she is about to be in the lineage of the Savior of the world? If she, what if she had said, nah, I'm not going to go. You could almost say, you're fixing to miss out on something really big. You understand that, don't you? Right? This is really big, right? What's her name? Rebecca. There she is. It's now Isaac and Rebecca. It was Abraham and Sarah and the promised land, seed, and blessing. And guess what? God is going to come to Isaac at a different time and going to promise him land, seed, and and blessing. It's the same promise. And and we'll talk more about these two boys right here in just a minute, but we'll see how it goes. So she's going to have to, what is she, she, she going to have to do? Let me ask you something. In our culture, would you marry somebody you've never seen? See, we date, right? They don't date. They didn't date. They didn't date. They didn't go to the malt shop. There wasn't a malt shop, right? They didn't date. It wasn't the same thing. And, and they might, you know, we talked about this, and we're going to see it on a Sunday morning not too long from now because the very last feast we're going to look at on Sunday mornings in Grow Group is the marriage, the, the marriage. And this is a picture. And, and the picture of the marriage, the Jewish marriage, is a picture of Jesus Christ marrying us. We are the what? The bride of Christ. I mean, we're going to see this. And so th this is so special. And so God has said, I put these two together so they could have this son. I'm putting these two together so they can have these two sons. But one of them is going to be the, the, the seed. One of them is going to be the one that carries on the lineage from Abraham to Isaac on down, which is going to have the land seed, the blessing, which is going to be the Jewish people which is going to be the key, and it's her. Sometimes we don't realize that some decisions we make uh, have amazing, huge, um, I don't want to like to use the word consequences. It sounds like it's negative, but it has an amazing events that happen to it. Think how your life has changed when you actually and understood and believed in Christ to give you eternal life. You've never been the same, have you? Never been the same. Because you pass from death to life, from being a child of the devil to a child of God, to being dead in trespasses and sins, to be alive in Jesus Christ. Your destiny went from separation from God forever to having life with God forever. All because of a decision. Because you believed in Christ for eternal life. It's amazing. And, and for some of you, not everybody, I'm sure, but there's some of you who made a bigger decision, a different decision, and that was that you decided that you wanted your life to count for Christ. You became a disciple of Christ. There's a difference. Salvation costs you nothing. Discipleship costs you what? Your life. And some of you made the decision and said, I want my life to count for Christ. I will go anywhere. I'll do anything, whatever he wants me to do. I want to do that. And that decision has changed your whole life as well. And so we think of Rebecca saying, will you go with this man? And she goes, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. She might have said, I'd like to see another part of the world anyway. How bad could it be? He seems to be rich. Right? The old saying, you can love somebody rich just as good as you can love somebody poor. You know? So anyway, that's, she's going to go with the man. So she says yes. And uh, it's amazing. Look at verse 59. So they sent away, her, sent away their sister Rebecca and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men. They left. And she didn't go by herself. I mean, they've got money. They have a servant. 
it, it's the woman that's going to probably been with her since she was born. And has always known Rebecca. And Rebecca's not going to go off somewhere without, without this, this maid, this, this one that's been with her, this nurse with Abraham's servant. And they bless Rebecca. Look at what they said to her. May you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands. May your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. And basically saying, may you have victory over everything. May you have a lot of kids. We just hope you have a whole bunch of kids and just everything. And you get God protects you. And you're going to love this man. And everything's going to be really good. That's what, we're, that's what we want. Then Rebecca got up with her female attendants. Attend, notice, what does it say? Is it just a nurse and her going? No, there's a, bunch, there's a bunch of people going. And they mounted the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebecca and departed. Wow. Wow. And they left. They left. Uh, Alan Ross, who's a professor at Dallas Seminary, when I was there, in Hebrew professor, he said, the choice of the bride is God's choice. The sign is confirmed. Laban recognizes this, and Rebecca complies. They, they all said, this is from God. Have you ever in your life just known that something's from God, especially if it matches the Scripture? I mean, you just know it. And so they're going to go back. They're ready to go. And it, by the way, it's not a short journey, right? It's not a short journey. If you remember that from where Abraham was to Mount Moriah was how many days' journey? That, that's not very far at all. You've got to go from there all the way up to Haran, which is a long way. And so this is not an easy, it was not an easy trip for the servant. It's not going to be an easy trip going back, but they're going to, they're going to make it. And so look what happens. They left, and they're making the trip back to Canaan. What is Isaac doing? Look at verse 62. Now Isaac had come back from a journey to Beer Lahaila Roy, for he was living in the Negev. Negev means the south. He's living in the southern part of the land. Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward the evening, and he raised his eyes and looked, and behold, camels were coming. Can you imagine? What was he doing? What was he doing? He, he'd gone to the south part of the field to meditate, and he saw the caravan. What do you think he thought? Huh? Here, here, she's coming. She's coming, boy. I hope she's what? I hope she's pretty. I hope she's real pretty. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what he's looking for. And, and look what happens. You're going to love this, y'all. You're going to love this. Watch. Watch what happens. Uh, Rebecca raised her eyes and she, when she saw Isaac. She dismounted from the camel. And she said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? He's coming. And she sees him, and she sees him coming, and she said, Who is that man? And the servant said, He is my master. He, that's him. He's the, he's the husband. And look what, she, look what she does. Now, you may not understand this, but look what she does. Then she took her veil and covered herself. What is, wait a minute. What, let me, do I have anything about that? Yeah, she covered herself with a veil. What, what does that mean? Did she want him to see her face? No. You know what this is? A, an unmarried woman wearing a veil most of the time, especially when she was with men. And the day they got married, they, she took the veil off and put it on his shoulder. Symbolic of saying, I'm coming under your authority. Do you remember when it says... The hold about the birth of Jesus Christ, and it says he'll be the king and the government will be upon his shoulders. That means the government comes under his authority. So when she took, she put the veil on until when? When do you think she's going to take it off? On the wedding day, yeah. And, and so she's saying, I'm, 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 I'm ready, I'm ready. What did she do? She, because the veil, I think I put it, veil was a sign of betrothal at the ceremony taken off and laid on the groom's shoulder. Uh, it's, just, it's a beautiful picture. You know, we, I mean, it's just a beautiful picture. And so what happens there? What did Isaac do? What did he do? Notice it goes on to say, uh, the servant told Isaac all the things he had done. Can you imagine Isaac him telling him, I said about this girl, I saw her, she came out, I said, let me do the, and it came out perfectly, and then the family said, yeah, and she said, yeah, it's just God all the way, and in fact, it was the family, it was everything we could have ever asked for. Servant told Isaac all the things that he had done, Isaac brought her into his mother's, mother Sarah's tent, and took Rebecca, 
she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. He's missed. He's missed who? Sarah. And now he has a bride. And so I put there, uh, he married Rebecca and he loved Rebecca. Is, it, is that what it says? He loved her. I, how do you love somebody you don't know? Because love is not an emotion. Love is an action. Loving someone is committing to that person. When I've done 315 weddings, maybe, maybe more. I can't even remember the final number. Uh, well, not the final number. I probably got to do some more. I got at least th- <laughs> three. I got two more this summer for sure. But uh, when people get married, if it's emotion, it, it, it's not possible to last. You can't stay on emotional high. Love is not emotion. Love is commitment. Love has emotions with it, but emotions go up and down. Commitment is love. Love is doing something for the other person. It says he loved her. He made the decision that he would love her for the rest of his life. That's what he did. Wow, it's so beautiful. So as we think about this, and we're going to, uh, if you, the next page has actually that this whole thing is like a type of Christ. It's like getting the bride. The bride for Isaac is like getting the bride for Christ. Isaac wants a bride, Genesis 24. God wants a bride for his son, First Peter 3, 18, Ephesians 5, about the picture of Christ in the church. He sends a servant. God sent the Holy Spirit, John chapter 16. Uh, he finds Rebecca. The Lord finds the church, so to speak. The price is paid. The price is paid. First Peter 1.18. What's the price for us? The blood of Jesus Christ. We're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And then Re- Rebecca, what does she do? She agrees to go. What do we do? We come by faith. We agree. We believe. By grace we've been saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not of works. Acts 16.31. We believe. And, and then Isaac meets Rebecca in the field. Where does Christ meet us? In the air. In the air. So it's a bride. It's a great picture. So you can just remember that. The, the Bible is full of, of, uh, of types and those kind of things. In fact, the very last lesson uh, that we're going to do in Sunday, in Sunday morning on, in Grow Group is tying together all of the feasts. But we're going to show you three different types from the Old Testament that are basically foreshadows of something in the New Testament. So, wow. Wow. Uh, Well, we got it. We're doing great. Now, Sarah's gone. She died at what age? How old is Abraham? He's at least 147. He may be older. Let's just say since Sarah's... Let's just make him 150. You want to kind of round it off. How how long... How old will he be? How, How long does he live? Abraham. He lives to be 175 years old. Y'all realize that? He's old. That's old. About 100 more years than me. Okay? So anyway, so what's next? Let's talk about the man, Abraham. And we go all the way back to Genesis 12. And let me just say this to you about Abraham. When you look at the Scripture, the first 11 chapters are or a little bit vague. You got Adam and Eve, and you got Enoch, and you got Noah, and you got the flood, and you got all this going on. And then suddenly, out of the blue, God picks a man. Abram, Ur the Chaldees, go to a land I will show you, and I will give you. I'll give you a land, a seed, and a blessing. And the whole rest of the Bible goes back to this man looking for Abraham to Isaac, Isaac on that, all the way to Jesus Christ. Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. Now let me ask you a question. When Abraham married Sarah and they didn't have kids, I'm going to say it in a weird way. Whose fault was it? Whose fault was it? It's not Abraham, right? Because Abraham had a baby through this lady. Okay, and now then Sarah is able to conceive because God made the promise. And now Abraham's remarried. Did he have kids? At 140 something? Look at this. She bore to him... Zimram, Joshian, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shusha. Shua. He, let's just say he's 140 years old and he got six more kids, right? Man, he might see, not see them graduate from college. But anyway, think about it. He marries the second time. I think, uh, but, but here's the key, and this is the thing 
Abraham was 70, 175 years old when he died. But what we, we uh, uh, I want you to see something. Did we get Abraham Mary Keturah? You got that. And here, now, one thing with that, the slide that we went past, the inheritance, let me go back and see if it'll work. The inheritance belongs to Isaac. Let me, let me read this to you. Look at this in verse, I think it's verse 5. Now, Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. Everything goes to Isaac, okay? But he gave the sons of the concubines. Abraham gave his gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son Isaac. So he had these other, he married Keturah, but he had, and he had kids, but he sent them away. He gave them some things and sent them away. But Abraham said everything, the, the, everything goes to Isaac because this is going to be the promise. And so we see in verse 7 and 8, it says, these are the years of Abraham's life. He lived 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age as an old man satisfied with life, and he was gathered to his people. He lived to be 175, and he died. God made a promise. By the way, back in Genesis 15, 15, if you want to just write down, Genesis 15, 15, God said that Abraham would live and die at a ripe old age in comfort. And he did. And so I want you to think about something for just a minute about Abraham. Abraham was a man of faith. He was a man of faith. And I want you to, let's think about faith over and over again. The book of Hebrews, it says, by faith Abraham did this. By faith Abraham did this. Paul actually says that all believers, people of faith, are like Abraham because he was a man of faith. I want you to look at this. By faith he left the earth to go to the promised land. By faith he separated from Lot. By faith he sent away Ishmael. By faith he waited 25 years for the promised land. By faith he was offered up Isaac as a sacrifice to God, believing that God would raise him from the dead. He was a man of great faith, a man of faith. And, and what we see as, as we think, think about it, he was a man of great faith. We are to be men and women, what? Of faith. And I think you've got that in your little book there. And I want to talk about it for just a second. I'm looking at the time. We, we might, if we get through early, we can do Bible questions. And I'm just, but I don't want to go too fast. I want you to see something here. He was a man of faith. What are we men and women of faith? I want you to think about this. Look at this. Salvation is what? It's by faith. It, it, it always has been, always will be. How was Abraham saved? By faith. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for Righteousness, that's what it is. Look at Galatians 3.26. For you're all sons of God through what? Faith in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.26. Romans 3.28. We maintain that a man is justified, how? By faith, apart from the works of the law. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, what? Believes, that's what? That's faith, will never perish but have eternal life. So the whole idea of salvation is always by faith. Now watch this, because you've got this as well. Look, Christian life is a walk of faith. How do you live the Christian life? It's not works. In fact, the whole book of Galatians, he actually says to them, did you begin by the Spirit? The answer is yes. Are you supposed to live your life by the law? And the answer is no. You live it by faith. Second Corinthians 5, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We're to know and apply the Word of God. Faith comes by Hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so what we got to do is when you think of this man who God used to change the whole world. Change the whole world. What people group came from this man? Huh? The Jewish people. The Jews. Every Jew that's a true Jew came from this man right here. Abraham to Isaac. And then we're going to see it goes on down to up and it goes on down, everyone, because Paul says not all Israel is what Israel. Let me say something. The, 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 the kids right here are they Jewish? No, these kids right the, this kids right here ultimately they're not the, the kids of the promise. They're not. Only the ones from Abraham to if you want to talk about what true Jew is. A true Jew is one who's a descendant of Abraham through Isaac. And Jacob, that's the true Jew. Yes. We well, we're gonna. Uh, Ishmael had got twelve tribes, and he became wealthy, but he was called a wild donkey of a man, 
and he was always fighting. And we, we, uh, we're going to see that when Abraham dies, Ishmael comes back. They bury him. We're going to see it in just a minute. He comes back to bury his father. But the best we can tell, they never got along, and they never were close. Of course, he's older. He's, what, 13 years older than that. So when, when Isaac gets a bride at 40, he's 53. But he married a, a bunch of different people, this guy did. Okay, so here we are. It's so sad. The man of faith dies. Well, look at this. Verses, uh, uh, just your question is perfect here. Genesis 25, 9 and 10. Look what it says. Then his son Isaac and Ishmael buried him. Where did they bury him? At the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephraim, the son of Zophar, the Hittite, facing what? Memory. The field which Abraham what? Purchased from the sons of Heath. There Abraham was buried with his wife, Sarah. Okay, so it goes back that they have, does Abraham own all the land? Let's put it this way. Does Abraham promise all of the land? Does he possess all the land? Does he own any of the land? One little place, a cave at the end of the field with the oaks of Mamre, and the cave of Machpelah, and the sons of Hith, and, and all of that. That's, that's all there is. And so, when he died, Isaac and Ishmael came, and they came to the cave. And where Sarah was already buried, they put Abraham in there. So, wow. It's, it's, it, it. Why do you think Isaac and Ishmael came together to bury their father? Huh? I mean, I couldn't hear the last words you said. He was, was going to get out of his father's, from his father. I, I, well, I don't know if he thought that or not. I know this, that he'd already got what he was going to get. Yeah. And he was, he was not considered, uh, he was a son of Abraham, but he was not considered the descendant, especially that's coming this way. I think death made them come together to bury their daddy. And we don't see much of them after that anymore, we, uh, at least of, of Ishmael. We'll see a lot on Isaac. and, and uh, yeah. So, now, verse 11 is a summary. So we've got it right here, a summary of Isaac, and it says this. It came about after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived by Beer Laha Roy. So that's in the southern part. So everything you might say, wow. And when I, whenever I read something like this, I go, wow, no more Abraham. Uh, it makes me sort of sad. I don't know about y'all, but I get into it. When I, when I read it and when I see the life of Christ, when I study these things, I mean, when D Jonathan died, when David went, it, it made me sad. Jonathan got killed, and that was David's best friend. I mean, yeah. Uh, what happens when he dies? Where did he go? Who? Um, oh, Abraham? Oh, okay. Uh, I don't want to hit anything. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to draw it right here. We know that from Luke 16, because this is the best we know, there's a place in the heart of the earth, and the Old Testament was called Sheol. And the New Testament's called Hades. It literally means place of the dead. We understand that when the Old Testament believers died, they went to a place called Abraham's bosom or paradise. It's in the heart of the earth. If an unbeliever died, they went to a side that we just call torments because they were in torment. And so when Abraham died, when Sarah died, they went down here. Okay? And that's why, that's why it's even called Abraham's bosom, because that was the place of Abraham. Okay? So don't be sad. Huh? Don't, oh, I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, I just can't make it. Uh, but anyway, no, you're right. But here's what's so good. When, because of sin, these people couldn't really be with the Lord. So when Jesus came and died on the cross and paid for sin, he removed the sin, the sin barrier, and it says in Ephesians that he led captivity captive, and the best we understand, he went down here and got all of the Old Testament believers and took them and changed paradise from the heart of the earth to the heavenly places. And that's why it says to be absent from the body is, where is Jesus? The right hand is from the Father. Paul says, I was caught up into the third heavens. I was caught up in 
paradise. So, in the Old Testament, until Jesus paid for sin, believers went to the good side, let's say it that way. Unbelievers went to the bad side. And that's why in the book of Revelation, at the very end, it said, Death and Hades gave up their dead. And this is the unbelievers are raised from the dead to be, be at the great white throne judgment. So, that's a great question. So, that's where he went. And he's fine. he was fine. And now... He's with, and his body's not been raised. The Old Testament saints' bodies will not be raised till Jesus comes to set up the kingdom. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. So we're going to beat him being raised because when the, Jesus comes in the clouds, the dead in Christ will be raised and will be changed. And we get changed before they do. It's amazing. Okay, now, so that was the summary. Everything looks good. And, and by the way, if you read... The very next verse. Now these are the records of the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's slave warning, brought to... And so if you read those verses there, it gives you a little bit of impact on who he was, okay? On what he did, those kind of things. Okay, it's now time for the babies. It's time for the babies to be born. And so the third thing is the twins are born. And let me tell you... The twins complicate everything. Now, we all know that twins complicate everything anyway. There's got to be two of everything. It's just a mess. And, but these twins, they're going to complicate everything. Why? Abraham to Isaac. Isaac to... Whoa. We don't have, we don't have one son that we say gets it. And, and by the way, this guy Jacob, how many sons is he going to have? Twelve. Twelve. Well, thanks a lot. It gets more complicated. So let's see what happens. The twins are born. Let's go to Genesis 25, beginning about verse 19. Now, these are the records of the uh, the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter. And it goes on down. Then it says, Isaac, verse 27, um, 21 Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. And the Lord answered him, and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. We'd say, oh, wow, this, this, is, this is great. So this is the background. The wife, she's going to have a baby. We're all excited. So this, this, is, this is good. They, they've been praying about this because Abraham's now gone. They, he's, he's the man. And he's, he's, he, he knows that the land, the seed, the blessing, the Messiah, and everything's coming through them. He understood it. He understood that at a point in time in his life, he almost got killed and be raised from the dead just to prove a point. And so he's ready for a child. And so she's going to have a baby. But look what happens. Verse 22. But the children struggled with the children? But the children struggled within her. And she said, is this so? Why am I in this condition? So she inquired of the Lord. Now what's going on? What happened to Rebecca? She's, she's uh, got some problems. Let me, let, me, let me remind you of something about... Uh, about this family. You got Abraham, a man of faith. You got Jacob. The whole nation's named after him. What's Jacob's other name? Okay. You got Joseph. Everybody, he's famous. Coat of many colors. He's everything. Who's left out? Isaac. Isaac is called, he's called Abraham's son. <laughs> and he's called Jacob's father. You know, little glamour. It seemed his greatest event was when he was offered on the altar. I call him the quiet man. He's amazing. He's just the quiet man. So now, what's happened? Rebecca, it, it, 40 years old, he married Rebecca. We saw the story of the servant going to get the bride. What's happening to Rebecca? She's going to have a baby. But something's wrong. Something's wrong. You know, it's amazing that women, when they're having a baby, they know. They know when something's not exactly right. They just know it. They know if something's not right. And she says, something doesn't seem to be right. And I don't, I'm, I'm not sure that she even knows until she goes to the Lord that there's two of them there. You know, my twin sister and I were born in 1949, and they didn't do anything back in those days. And my mother went to the doctor, and she said, I have twins. And the doctor said, no, you don't. You don't. And, and Mama said, well, there's something kicking over here and something kicking over here. And the doctor said, you do not have twins. And they had to put her in the hospital because she was ble bleeding. In the, and, and guess what came out? Twins. Well, Rebecca is saying something's wrong. Something's not right. There's confusion in there. And so she goes to the Lord. And what the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. 
And the one people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Oh, my gracious, what is going on? So here we go. She struggles. What's happening? She's pregnant. And he says that there are two nations and two people inside of her. Who are the two nations? Do we know? This is Jacob, and that's who? That's the Jews. Who is this right here? This is Esau means red. Edomites. Edom. These are not these are not considered Jewish people. They're a different nation. He said, inside of you are two nations. Two nations and two people groups. And she's probably going, I I just don't understand this. Those two boys, they're two boys, and they'll become great nations. And they're struggling. They're struggling inside. And guess what's going to happen when they come out? They're going to struggle all of their lives. And uh, we're going to see what happens. And she, he tells her that this, the older will serve the younger. Let's stop. I'm gonna, I don't want to ever get close to that again, okay, because I could knock that over. But in a family, I'm just going to race this. We'll put some other stuff back up in a second. In a family, let's get it real fast. In a family that had sons, here's the daddy, and then son number one, older, and then son number two, number three, number four. Let's say this. So you had three sons. The oldest son got the double portion. And so they divided by three, but he got one and a half. And these other guys got two-thirds or whatever. The oldest son got a double portion. The oldest son was called the priest of the family. The oldest son got the blessing of the family. And so to be the oldest son was a big deal. But God said something different here. He said that there's going to be two people groups in there, and the older son will serve the what? Younger son. So let's, let's eliminate this because we got two boys. And what's supposed to happen, here's the oldest son. What's his name? What's his name going to be? We're going to find out. What is it? It's Esau. What's his son's name? Jacob. And they're going to be, and Esau is going to get the blessing. He's going to get the priesthood. He's going to get the double portion. He's going to get all of this, or so we think. But God says something different. He says the older son is actually going to serve the younger son. You could almost say, well, that, 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 that's not right. In Abraham's family, who was the oldest son? Who? Ishmael. Ishmael. Who got everything? Isaac. In Isaac's family, who's the oldest son? Esau. Who's going to get everything? Jacob. That, that's God's plan. In this case, uh, the older son gets the birthright, the double portion, the priesthood, the blessing. They get all of those things. And birthright was the one that stood out and said, "This, I, I, yeah, I didn't even put it up here. The birthright was the big deal. The birthright and the blessing are the two big deals. The priesthood of the family usually, while well, the father's still alive, the father gets to be the priest. But the double portion, now you want that. You're going to get twice as much as everybody else. And so that's the plan. And, but she's told the younger one is going to be the one. And she, she's not going to forget this, by the way. She's not going to forget this. Who decided that the older son would serve the younger son? The older son will serve the younger son. The seed, the choice is going to the younger. I want to read something to you. You don't have to turn there. This is Romans chapter 9. This is God explaining something. Now, a lot of people read this wrong, okay? They, they miss the point. They think, let me ask you this question. Does the seed from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob on down, does that have anything to do with salvation? It does not. They weren't saved. God didn't save Abraham when he picked him. God picked him. Abraham believed and was saved. Isaac believed and was saved. We're going to see that Jacob believed and was saved. To God picking these people have nothing to do with eternal life salvation. It has to do with God's plan of service. 
Now watch what he says in Romans 9, or just listen to what he says in Romans chapter 9. I'm going to start at verse 10. And not only that, but there was also Rebecca when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Now, is he talking about eternal life salvation there? No, he's talking about God picked everything would come through Jacob. Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. That's the plan. It has nothing to do with salvation. Many people read Romans 9, 10, and 11 and think he's talking about that God picked them to be saved. This is not talking about salvation. This is talking about God's plan to build the nation of Israel on which he's going to bring them aside. Does this make sense? So just remember that. Don't get confused because a lot of people here have heard the term election and they think God picks people to be saved. He does not pick people. We'll talk about it some other time. But anyway, uh, so here's the bottom line. And so Romans 9, 10, and 11, it says the older will serve the younger. That's what God said, uh, and, and Paul is writing that down. Watch this. God decided the seed. God chose Jacob because he what? Why did God choose Jacob? Because he chose it. The, the boys did nothing bad, nothing good or bad. They hadn't even been born yet. God chose Jacob to carry out the plan. Who chose Abraham? What did, God do? what did Abraham do to get chosen by God? Nothing. Who chose, who chose Isaac? God did. Who, who decided that? God. Who chose Jacob? This has nothing to do with salvation. This has to do with service. You know what Paul says about his ministry? He says, God chose me in my mother's womb that I would proclaim the message to the Gentiles. He's not talking, he didn't say God chose me to save me. He said God chose me to use me. Listen, if you see choosing an election in the Bible, it is for service, not for salvation. Just remember that. Study the passages, dig it. We'll talk about it sometime in a, in a different way. So, uh, so what, did, uh, what did we get? The nation, the nation was, to, was chosen to carry out God's plan. What was it? To give us the Bible and to give us the Messiah. The Bible is a Jewish book. If, if, if Luke was not Jewish, and we're not sure, if Luke is not Jewish, he's the only writer of the Bible who wasn't Jewish. And where did the Messiah come from? Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, Jacob to Judah, Judah down to King David, King David all the way to Jesus Christ. Jewish people. So what happens? What happens? Well, the babies are born. Let's see, let's see this part. This is uh, uh, 25, 25. When the, uh, 25, 24. When the days were leading up to the delivery of time, she found that they were twins. Behold, they were twins in her womb. Uh, did she know that? She sort of knew that, but she didn't know that. I mean, she didn't know for sure in the sense that she could tell because she went to the doctor and had an ultrasound. She just knew that God said, you've got two people in there. She knew something wasn't right. She said, I know something. Not, it's like my mother. That somebody's kicking over here, somebody's kicking over here. That's not possible. Now, the first one came out red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. What does Esau mean? Do you know? Huh? Uh, well, Edom means red. It, has the idea, it means hairy. Okay? But it has the idea of redness too because he's going he's got, he's to be red and hairy at the same time. And so uh, if you got the twins born, the first one came out red and hairy. And look at this, what happened in the second. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. When did he get married? 40. 40. They waited how long? 20 years to get the babies. To get the babies. What's Jacob's name? It's the hair, Esau is the Hebrew word for hairy. It also it goes back to Edom. He's got another name, nickname, Edom, which means red. That's why we said red and hairy. So can you imagine this boy coming out all hairy and they're going, oh, look at that. That's, that's something. And what about Jacob? Seized by the heel. It could be positive. The name sometimes could be. You know what name we get from Jacob? We get the name James from Jacob. 
And it means to seize by the heel. It could be positive to mean like a protector, but it can be negative like to trick, to lie, or supplant. What was he doing to his brother as his brother got out ahead of him? He's trying to grab him and keep him from being the first one. But Jacob doesn't realize he's going to be the stuff. And uh, so, wow. This is th this. Now, who's supposed to get the birthright, the blessing, the double portion? In the priesthood. Who's supposed to get that? Esau. Esau is. But what did God say? It's coming not through Esau. Even though he's firstborn, it's coming through who? Jacob. Because there's two nations in you. Jews. We're going to say it. Arabs. Or we could just say Gentiles. That's what he's saying. Now watch this. By the way, you know that birthright was important. And one day, Esau was out in the woods hunting. And he comes in and he's very what? Hungry. And his brother is kind of likes to cook. And he's cooking this, this red stew. And he says, give me some of that stew. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you some of my stew if you'll give me your birthright. That is a big deal. And what does Esau say? What good's the birthright if I die from hunger? What an idiot. I mean, right? What did he do? He gave away the birthright, which put part of this double portion and everything else together because he's the first one. And we're going to see later on, what does Jacob do to Esau? He steals his what? His blessing. Let me tell you, in real life, you would probably like Esau and not like Jacob. And we're going to see some more things as we go through our life. But let's look at, let's look at something uh, about them. In verse 27, look what it says. Now, when the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a civilized man. <laughs> and my Bible reads civilized. It sort of means a peaceful man. It means a calm man, a man that uh, is a thinker and is smart. And those things. And so you got two different kind of boys. One guy is like the man's man, so to speak. He's a hunter and he's out there and his daddy loves his brother. And the other guy says, I, I'm not real big on all that hunting and stuff. And I just soon, you know, read and stay home and do other things like that. And so uh, the one is the man, the other is the peaceful man. Now, it, it, it doesn't mean like uh, Esau was the tough guy and, J and, and Jacob was like a sissy. No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that Jacob was more, a little bit different. And, and when, you, when you look at this, Esau loved the world. Fleshly, temporal, immoral. He was immoral. He was called an immoral man. And he's called fleshly because what did he do? He gave up his birthright for what? Something to eat because he said, I just can't wait to make myself something to eat. I've got to have it right now. And so it says in the Bible that he despised his birthright. That Jacob loved God and saw, saw things from an eternal perspective. And he was a guy under control. And he, he's pretty smart. But what does what happens in this family? And what we're going to see is a problem. And it's a real problem. Here's the problem. Favoritism. Notice verse 28. Now, Isaac loved who? Anybody know? Look at your Bible. Now, Isaac loved who? Esau. Esau because he had a taste for game. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Oh, you got a problem. You got favoritism. You got the mama saying, I love this boy. You got the daddy saying, well, I love this boy. And... What's the promise? What is the promise from God? This guy's going to be the one, right? But what does Daddy try to do? And we're going to see in the next couple of weeks what happens, especially... And let me just say something. Favoritism in a household won't ever work. Uh, Sometimes it, it happens. Sometimes it's easy for it to happen. It's so sometimes in families, you know, you got one child that's just crazy, and you got the other child that's just wonderful, and you know. But and and this one would say, "You treat that one better. You like that one better." And then, and, 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 but and this is what happens in this family. Esau is really loved by by his dad, and Jacob is loved by his mother, and. 
there's going to be problems. So let me give you applications and we'll do the quiz. Uh, uh, she rem she's going to remember that God said the older will serve the younger. Guess what? Uh, Isaac would like to forget that. But you know what you can't do? You can't forget a promise of God. You can't forget a plan of God. So let's do this. So what do we what do we count important? What are we doing with our lives? Do we look at the temporal or eternal when you see somebody like that? So let, let's uh, there's two ways we can live: eternal or future. Let's let's go on to applications. Let's be men and women of faith. What was Abraham famous for? A man of faith. All the way back, he believed God. He believed God. He believed God. When Paul says, what do you want to be? If you want to be a man of faith, you're just like Abraham. And when you believe God, you're just like Abraham. And so that's what we want to be. Second, let's trust God in the events of our lives. Isaac and Rebecca and Abraham and the, the twins and getting the bride and all of that stuff. Isaac had to trust that when that servant went to find him a bride, it would be somebody he wanted. And when she got, had to trust that she's fixing to leave and go, and she has no idea what this man's going to be like. And they just had to trust God. And Abraham had to trust his servant that his servant would make wise choices. I mean, just think about it. And we have to trust who? We have to trust God in everything that goes on in our lives. The third thing is, let, God, let us realize God decides our gifts, talents, and ministries. Who decided which one would get the blessing, so to speak? God did. Who decided back up, up there? Who decided? Who decided what spiritual gifts you have? God did. Now, you didn't decide it. You can't, you can't say, I think I want this gift. Give it to me, God. I'm going to take it. No, you, listen, God gives us spiritual gifts. God gives us talents and abilities. Listen, you could tell you all day long, JB, we want you to learn to play the piano. That is never going to happen. It doesn't matter how many times I practice. I got no rhythm. I can't do that. I just can't do it. Uh, I can do other things. Uh, uh, ministries. God decides ultimately the ministries. It just works out based on your gifts and your talents and your abilities. And you're faithful to God and you just say, God, just use me. He's going to use you in things and ways that you can't even imagine. God is working just like he did Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and on down. And then finally... Let's live for the eternal, not the temporal. Who lived for the temporal? Esau. Who lived for the eternal? Jacob did. Even though we'd say he's a bad guy. Okay? Uh, as we go through this, we're going to get a good look at the two characters of Jacob and Esau and what they were like.